Hello, everybody. Greetings from Heartcare Foundation of India, IGCP Group, and Med Talks. I am Dr. K.K. Agarwal. Corona Namaste to everybody, all my doctors, all my physicians, all across the world. Corona Namaste. We are in the midst of a coronavirus a pandemic. Today, we, our conference is going to have a series of lectures, and we will be basically talking about what Ministry of Health and WHO has talked about this virus and what's latest as far as this virus is concerned. To start with, I have with me Dr. Ambrish Mittal, the Chairman and Head of Endocrinology and Diabetes at Pan Max, Max Super Speciality Hospital, Saket. Close friend, a Padma Bhushan awardee, an academician par excellent. And if you see the photo of COVID, it reminds us of the word coronary artery. The word corona came from coronary artery and the word coronary is crown. The word crown looks like a sun. And whenever we see the sun, it reminds us of vitamin D. So we thought that why shouldn't we talk to Dr. Mittal and listen to him about the role of vitamin D in COVID-19. Ambarish, all yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Agarwal. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. And when you first asked me to talk, I presumed it's going to be diabetes in COVID-19. And I've done that like six times. So I'm glad uh, there's a change today. And I'm talking of uh, vitamin D in COVID-19, which also happens to be my favorite area of work. So for once, I think diabetes, and somebody else is talking. And I and I will uh, be talking about vitamin D in COVID-19. So the the... The first thing about vitamin D is that there are believers and there are non-believers. So you can either be one of those believers who thinks every, everything in the world, including divorce, is linked to vitamin D deficiency. Or you can be a non-believer and say this is all hype and there's nothing in this. So as usual, we will try to sift the hype from the truth and get you the science behind vitamin D in relation to our present situation. Let's, let's go over each of uh, these slides. This is uh, going to explain to you a little bit about Corona. I did that because I saw I was the first speaker. So just a couple of slides about that. You've heard enough about that. So I won't labor those points. And then a little bit about vitamin D. And then is there any link between these two apparently disparate things? So this is a purely academic exercise. As you know, this is a great effort uh, by Dr. Agarwal and his team. And obviously, this is a... Uh, pro bono exercise, no need to say that, but nevertheless, it's a protocol, so I'm describing, I've not received any speaker fear on radio for this activity. So we all know that coronaviruses are important human and animal pathogens, and you also know very well that at the end of 2019, uh, this Wuhan, the whole story, you know, the a novel coronavirus, coronavirus also causes common cold, this crown-shaped virus, the little thing is really creating so many problems for us, uh, but it also more recently, the SARS, the huge epidemic, which India faced pretty well, I thought, but East Asia got swamped by it, and which actually changed the practice of infectious disease in, South, in East Asia in terms of uh, personal protective equipment, even in public, in terms of screening, even in public, and in terms of preparation with ventilators and other things for any future epidemics. So it was SARS was a huge game changer there. And this is a, this is a SARS uh, coronavirus 2, which is come from the same group. Uh, basically severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus and actually COVID-19 is the disease and SARS-CoV-2 is probably a better way to say it but the disease is COVID-19 and the virus is coronavirus so sometimes we use it interchangeably it's all right but we need to understand the difference now the clinical features again are rapidly changing by the rapid we are realizing the spectrum is much greater this is, of course, from the first study, which everyone quotes, the New England Journal of Medicine study, descriptive study of people from China, which really showed about uh, what were the things that people presented with, dry cough, fatigue, sputum, shortness of it. Everybody has that. Any viral fever has that. We may try to distinguish subtle things. Persistence of dry cough, maybe we might say is something important. Uh, and shortness of breath is a key sign here. You don't miss the sign of, because, you know, coronavirus is going to go through the community in some form or the other, especially for all of us healthcare professionals. So the, the, the cardinal sign is shortness of breath, which means 
they do require hospital care. And across the world, this has been taken as the main thing, not just fatigue, not just fever, not just dry cough. But when these things start happening, then, then you require hospital care and not just home isolation or home quarantine. And of course, myalgia, arthralgia, not so much, but uh, there are different sort of series. This is the first one, fever 87%, dry cough 67 Some have shown dry cough 85 90%. So this will keep varying. And this is just one, one sort of... A cohort and you will find many many groups describing different things now recently there is a lot of talk of about three percent people go into ARDS and I think that's critical so one of the key areas where we need to focus is that anyone coming with any respiratory complaint as doctors now if I had the choice and if I had the availability people who come with these symptoms now even if they don't have ARDS, they are not that severe. I would ideally want to do a test, but I realize that there are limitations. So at least those who come with significant pneumonia or ARDS should have testing done for the virus. Chest X-ray abnormality detected routinely. And of course, they, uh, the Chinese use a lot of chest CDs. In fact, in their earlier, in the second line, in the second uh, sort of, not second line, in the second wave, they actually used chest CT very liberally and were quickly able to you know, put the person at high risk and, and suspicion. So I think that is one thing that you can consider. But these are all suggestions. I'm not a clinic, clinical expert in corona uh, virus per se. I am not a virologist and I'm not an epidemiologist, but we are all internal medicine physicians to some extent at least. The recently described features are sense of smell and taste. Loss of smell and taste has turned out to be a very interesting feature. People presenting with GI is what hooks it on to the receptor in the body, the spike protein. And this can be a target for intervention. Why is it important? It can be a target for intervention. And similarly, the, the, the docking of this with the receptor A2, as you see here on the slide, this receptor here, that also you can see is very, very, this whole area can be a very important target of intervention for treating this condition. The receptor, ACE receptors, the ACE molecule, which is a receptor for this virus, is present on the surface of the cell SARS also that basically this this is the binding here and it's important again to understand that the A it is anti-inflammatory and it is anti-apoptotic so it is a protector and if you look at this uh, carefully you will see that the ACE2 uh, is actually protecting and when we use things that raise ACE2 that typically protect us. Now when we use ACE inhibitors, that's what we do. We are also raising the ACE2 at some level, you know, or ARVs even. The issue, of course, is that the ACE2 also is the portal which the, the virus enters. So there is a bit of a sort of uh, lack of clarity as to the exact impact of ACE2 on the uh, seriousness or the gravity of the condition. There's still a little uh, uh, lack of clarity there. And I'm sure experts in this field who are all uh, day going to be with you will explain this further. But it is, the thing to remember is ACE2 inhibitor, ACE2. ACE2 is generally good for us. Higher level of ACE2 expression in the cells is considered protective. Anti-atrophy, anti-fibrosis, anti-inflammation, antioxidant. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the same, this virus also enters it through ACE2. So there will be certainly drugs targeted in this area. We do not know whether in this particular case, increasing ACE2 is going to be beneficial as it is generally, or whether it will provide a further portal for the virus. As some people said, we shouldn't be using ACE inhibitors, but all that is still controversial. This is just the mode of the action that we know. And this is how the interaction happens. Look at how beautifully the NEGM paper showed this. Uh, this is the SARS-CoV protein here. See the binding onto the ACE2 receptor, entering the cell, RNA, RNA virus, and when it enters the cell, it throws everything off. As you know, we won't go down those steps, but it leads to acute lung injury and adverse uh, myocardial modeling and everything. So I think this is important to remember that, that we will, that uh, these, uh, this entry into the cell is via this ACE2 mechanism. And once it enters the cell, it takes control like viruses do and alters the whole genomic uh, pattern of the cell. Exactly. So basically, as of when this it enters the cell, the surface ACE2 is down-regulated further. 
So there is unopposed angiotensin II accumulation and therefore that is harmful vasoconstriction, lung injury, etc. It is thought that the local activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system may actually uh, mediate lung injury responses to viral insults. So this is again, and summarizing it before quickly moving on now because already uh, 10 minutes have gone. So basically there is entry by the ACE2, antigen presentation, cellular immunity, and these when they happen, they actually cause a cytokine storm. And the cytokine storm is a cytokine or whichever way you use it, it is what damages the seriousness of the condition is determined by the seriousness of the cytokine storm. And I think that's very, very important to remember. You enter the cell, you, you, you initiate excited immune response, and there's a flood of cytokines. And it is a, so other target, treatment target will always be how to limit the cytokine storm, either entering in the cell or cytokine. These are two of the most commonly uh, researched targets for treatment of this virus at the moment. But as I said, others will tell you more. What about vitamin D? Let's quickly see. Vitamin D, we know, is, is not just a nutrient. In fact, it's more like a hormone. And it is important. It is critical because its deficiency is pandemic. But it's also critical for us to absorb calcium. We know from our MBBS days, I mean, there's no confusion about that, that vitamin D actually is important to absorb calcium. If you don't have vitamin D, you can take tons of calcium, but it won't reach your bone. It's also a pandemic we'll show you about. It is, of course, we know that the main source is sunlight. It's formed in the skin. UV beta rays fall on the skin. If you go in the sun between 11 and 3 in the day, you get significant amount of UV beta rays and you get significant amount of vitamin D, especially these days when the pollution has dramatically come down. Sunlight exposure can be a huge source of vitamin D. Otherwise, when it's very polluted, you don't get enough vitamin D even through sun. And overall, there's a huge number of people who are affected, even in tropical countries like India. And we'll quickly go through the Indian scene, which is something that we have shown. But before that, it's the classic function I already explained, absorbing calcium, pushing it to the bone. But the vitamin D receptor is everywhere. So it's obviously doing something. Now, we don't know whether these can really be direct clinical consequences. But the associations of low vitamin D are present, I mean, the association of conditions uh, with low vitamin D is huge and everything. And here I would say, at least you look at respiratory disorders quite clearly where there is more evidence as compared to autoimmune disorder, as compared to diabetes or others. In respiratory disorder, there is more evidence, we'll quickly discuss that, that vitamin D deficiency actually predisposes you and makes you more prone to respiratory infections. We will talk about that. We all know about its impact on osteoporosis. We also all need to understand that there is a significant impact on muscle strength. All of, all of you have seen cases of osteomalacia and the kind of profound muscle weakness that happens. So for today, we will focus on, on, on bone muscle, yes, but primarily we will focus on respiratory consequences and immune effects and we will not focus on all the others. It's not possible to do that today. Uh, Again, it has a direct impact on cellular and humoral immunity, both. I won't try to explain this in detail, uh, but it is true that if you have higher levels of 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, which is formed locally in the cells, not the circulating 125, that has a protective effect in our immunity and enhances our immunity in a crude, simplified way. That's what we need to remember. Then what about India? And we, we're working on this area. We've shown repeatedly this is one of our a paper that gained a lot of uh, recognition that time. It's a review for the IOF, which talks about global vitamin D status. And you know that India falls in the orange or red zone, which is low vitamin D generally in urban India. Now suddenly somebody will get up, why do we have, and no, it's not true. If you look at the, the, the rickshaw pullers, if you look at, at people who are in the sun, manual construction workers, they are not vitamin D deficient. But rest of us in urban India are vitamin D deficient. It is changing with the fortification of milk now. Mother dairy and others are fortifying milk, but still it is there. It is significant. Well, fortification adds only a small amount and actually takes care of the severity of the disease. It doesn't really eradicate D deficiency, but it helps. So India is seriously affected. And we know that whether, and I'll brush, go through this because you've heard me many times on this. Uh, we know that it, it's in breastfed infants, in mothers, in school children, horrific, horrific figures in school children of 10 nanograms, 11 nanograms. 
uh, urban Indian adults, the original study showed numbers of four or five nanogram. My own study showed that in hospital staff, which are pathetic. Uh, paramilitary forces are always better off as expected. So rural data, there is not that much rural data, but nevertheless, it suggests that many women, especially and girls who are even in rural areas, very well covered, they probably have low D levels, but young boys, small boys who play in the sun, especially in winter, their levels are relatively all right. But overall, especially in winter overall, we tend to have low D levels uh, in this country. And this is my favorite slide, a study with it several years ago of healthcare professionals, of all those who were attending vitamin D lectures. And we tried to, we offered them a free vitamin D estimation. And this is what we found. The red part, of course, is the deficient population. So there is a huge number there. Elderly also, we have low vitamin D levels. And why do we have it? Because of latitude, season, time of the day, cloud cover, atmospheric pollution, customary dress, sunscreen use, other extremes, customary dress in one part of the population, like you can see in the picture down below here, and sunscreen use in the other part of the population, in city dwelling uh, urban women, especially who use sunscreen all the time. So we won't labor that point. Now, what is the good level to achieve? Typically, uh, we would want for rickets for kids at least 12 nanograms and general population we would like all to be above 20 nanograms so 30 below 30 calling them deficient is not really correct uh, 20 to 30 would still be called as fairly okay but if you have a specific condition if you have osteoporosis if you have had a fracture if you have, in that age group you may want to achieve levels of 30 or more but overall 20 is a good number to keep in mind 20 nanogram you are largely protecting your population uh, and therefore, the vitamin D recommendations for Indians, we should have 1,000 to 2,000 units a day to maintain such levels, otherwise we cannot. This 400, 600 is not going to work. Unless our fortification program becomes so good that we require only that amount. What does this, all this have to do with COVID-19? Last few minutes, vitamin D deficiency is a risk factor for development of acute respiratory distress syndrome. And that is important. And ARDS is the main cause of death in COVID-19. Now, if you look at these studies, this is data from 2015, which showed that vitamin D deficiency levels of below 20 nanogram, 20 nanogram is 50 nanomoles, 1 nanogram is 2.5, 2.5, right? So vitamin D deficiency in this ICU setting resulted in exaggerated alveolar inflammation, epithelial damage, and actually increased, was thought to be one of the contributors to severity of ARDS. So this is important. This is not very old studies. These are relatively recent studies. This is in the ICU setting in ARDS. Now, other studies have looked at community pneumonia. And this study is from China, actually, which looked at there's an association between low D level and community acquired pneumonias. Both these studies are not intervention studies. They're only looking at association. So they're just telling you that there is People with low vitamin D seem to be getting more of this. Whether that is a cause and effect is still not understood, but there is an association. And then they looked at supplementation and they first looked at, at, at uh, surrogate markers and they looked at uh, cathelicidin levels, uh, the, what is called LL37 levels, which I'm told higher levels reduce the severity of septic shock. It's going the other way. So, it, is show, it was shown in the study, the surrogate marker, that using cholecalciferol, the usual vitamin D, actually raised cathelicidin levels, which could possibly improve sepsis related clinical outcomes. So, again, surrogate markers here. But what about this study, which was one of the most cited, a meta analysis in BMJ Open, which looked at vitamin D3 supplementation in patients with frequent respiratory infections. Randomized double blind study and then a meta analysis followed both together. If you look at this, you, uh, we, if this is a lot of data here, so let me just look at this. They used a high dose, we didn't do that, but 4000 IU for one year reduced symptoms of recurrent respiratory infections and reduced antibiotic use. And I think this is a single study uh, center, uh, single study in Karolinska actually, which was, uh, you know, 140 patients. And this showed that you were able to reduce uh, recurrence of respiratory tract infections. 
and and this is the meta analysis i was referring to by mistake earlier this is the meta analysis again 2017 bmj which looked at vitamin d supplementation all the studies a lot of hodgepodge in the studies it's very hard to do a meta analysis different doses different age group different population but they tried to do their best and looked at huge number of people 11000 participants and daily or weekly d supplementation for individuals with 25 d levels below 10 reduce the risk of respiratory infection by 50% again the more severe the d deficiency the more the efficacy of supplementation if someone has a baseline level of 20 and you're going to supplement you're not going to see much difference but given the fact that most indians have low levels we do feel that at least maintaining their levels maintaining their levels uh, to normal like above 20 or maybe even 30 in this case some people suggest 40 50 but we'll stay away from that if you're going to 20 30 nanograms you will get a benefit so here also repeatedly in studies patients who are severely deficient like many urban indians are get the maximum benefit from using vitamin d daily or weekly very large doses are not required not recommended those mega doses given once a year of you know very large doses six pack units injections and all are not recommended but daily doses and maybe weekly at the most are what is recommended and we'll describe the dose also quickly towards the end this i just found yesterday when i was preparing for this talk and this is a, a implication from an irish study and the whole data is not out this is an irish longitudinal study on aging where the the main the lead author says though we do not know specifically the role of vitamin d in covid 19 infections given its wider implications for improving immune responses and clear evidence for bone and muscle health those cocooning cocooning is isolating or uh, in quarantine and other at risk cohort should ensure that they have an adequate intake of vitamin d so you can't go wrong you cannot go wrong if you maintain adequate vitamin d and one uh, thing that this professor has thrown in is the fact that because you are going to be indoors you lose muscle mass also and your activity levels generally tend to go down although we are trying we are struggling with that and explaining that so therefore you would actually benefit both from bone and muscle and possibly you will also help your resistance to uh, or build up your immune system to fight against uh, infections now the other thing is that you already told you ace2 receptors are good for us they protect us and vitamin d up regulates ace2 receptors uh, it down regulates renin so we these are all uh, in vitro or basic science studies we don't know the exact correlation of this in the current current scenario but it seems to be uh, something that is very interesting so it's immuno modulatory it does lot of things with 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 tight junctions gap junctions adherence junctions it enhances cellular natural immunity again if you are severely deficient below 10 nanogram you are very much more likely to get into trouble but even if you are between 10 and 20 it's probably better to go up further and therefore you can actually improve your 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 outcomes uh, by by maintaining reasonable d levels and not becoming deficient i think that is very very important and therefore uh, you know when we administer vitamin d we reduce the expression of pro inflammatory cytokines and increase the expression of anti inflammatory cytokines i already gave you the example of ll37 uh, cathelicidin so i think these are important so you are doing multiple things you are modulating immunity you are you are you are reducing the risk of recurrent respiratory infections at least if you shouldn't be deficient are they giving it to everybody makes sense or not i don't know but given by the fact that urban indians are so significantly deficient either adequate sunlight exposure or ensuring fortified milk intake and probably giving low doses of vitamin d you will only help you cannot go wrong in your patients to summarize in the last two slides uh, vitamin d deficiency this is very recent has been shown to be independently associated with increased risk of viral acute respiratory infections in a number of observational studies and meta analysis of clinical trials of vitamin d supplementation for prevention of uh, ari have demonstrated some protective effects the effect is not dramatic but if again it depends i am repeating myself on how how deficient you are in those who are seriously deficient impact will be more in those who are not so deficient there will be some impact you cannot go wrong even in them 
So it's okay to use it without testing. You don't have to now add another thing. Everyone should go back to a B level. We are struggling with the resources. We are struggling with supplies. We need to be sure. A word of caution here is don't overdo vitamin D. Use correct dosages. Make sure you know what the patient is taking because these days every physician adds some vitamin D to the prescription. And by the time the patient reaches us, he's already got one cardiologist, one neurologist, one, you know, whatever. Everyone's added some vitamin D for everything. And therefore, the patient is already taking excess doses. So if we remember the rule of 2000 units per day, we are very safe. And if someone is already taking it, don't have to push. You know, more 60,000 weekly, no. If you're going to do it, you can use small doses weekly or you can use 60,000 even once a month. Sometimes it will suffice. But I would suggest using daily doses is a good option, at least in this situation where we are looking at fighting off this terrible epidemic. So, of course, I told you about the imbalance between ACE2, inflammation, uh, cytokine storm, but there is no study not even one study that has looked at vitamin D in COVID-19. There are studies on other SARS, but it's important to remember, you can't expect that to happen. It's going to happen now. Now that everyone's now focusing on COVID-19, you will get data on that also. At the moment, it is just extrapolation of vitamin D data on prevention of respiratory viral infections overall. There is no reason to believe that COVID-19 will be different. And if the ACE2 mechanism is playing a role, you might actually get some effect, which is very interesting, but we don't know that yet. I think I've managed to finish exactly on time. Uh, the, uh, as I said, obviously, I've said this is a purely academic exercise. Uh, we have two minutes, two and minutes. Uh, yes. I'll remember uh, if I have to sum up what Dr. Ambrish Mithal has said. He was talking about SARS-2, and the word 2 is very important because he also ended up by saying 2 for 2,000. That means 2,000 units of vitamin D should, should be taken in this particular uh, COVID type. So remember the word SARS-2 and 2 is 2,000. If you take, if you cover 2,000, you need not go for vitamin D testing. So specifically, all those who are high risk, who are diabetic, who are, who, how, how will I know I am high risk? If you cannot walk for more than 200 meters in six minutes, if you desaturate in two minutes, if in six minute walk, if you desaturate by more than 4%, and if your doctor says take pneumonia and flu vaccine, in whichever condition your doctor says take flu and pneumonia vaccine, you know you are a high risk for COVID-19, take 2000 units of vitamin D every day. So uh, if you want to add any other thing, Amrish, otherwise I'll say thank you to you. Yeah, I'll just add something that uh, that uh, got lost. I said it a little bit, but I think sunlight exposure these days is possible. At least these days, one of the sort of uh, spin-offs of this of this uh, sort of lockout, which is so terrible. So, so the number two is twice, two times in a day, morning and evening, go to the sunlight. So again, remember Actually, the word. I two. say you go. Best is to go at this time. This is the hottest time, but it's not so hot yet. The best is to go <laughs> at 2 o'clock. Yeah, 11, 1. So, so 2,000 units, 2 p.m. sunlight. And remember the word <laughs> SARS-2, we will be able to win it. Thank you, okay. uh, Amrish, to be here with us. And wonderful. And all those people who have their questions, they can send it to us. We will send. We will try to reply all your uh, answers. And if your slides are not copyright, then we will send the slides to those people the relevant slides to people who are willing for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Amrish, this uh, this uh, session was supported by Elkem, but uh, we have not, this uh, slides, this talk was not influenced by any brand or by any company. Thank you, Amrish. Thank you.